pleasure of introducing myself, uh, James Johnson, uh, University of Copenhagen, uh, also, at least for the next month or two, uh, still associated with the University of Chicago. Uh, so I guess I'm going to take us in a similar direction, but theoretically a very different direction, talking about aesthetics, uh, both of the, the burial, well, mostly just of the burial. So I'm going to start off with... Uh, excerpt from one of Keats's poems. Uh, Nor do we merely feel these essences for one short hour. The passion, poesy, glories infinite, haunt us till they become a cheering light unto our souls and bound to us so fast that whether there be shine or gloom, overcast, they always be, always must be with us or we die. Uh, for the individuals in this poem, many of the contradictory tensions exist between the isolation of uh, personal identity and moments of realization of the individual's miniaturized role in a cosmological ordering of society and nature. Keats produces an aesthetic time and movement through the poem, an aesthetic situated in ongoing and transitory, if not transcendent, experience, which masks the shared nature of human existence. At the same time, Keats emphasizes the dialectical relationship between the search for the sublime and the ongoing sense of belonging to something greater, something always hauntingly incomplete but pervasive. The implications of Keats's poem provide a valuable starting point for exploring the theme of this symposium, which is new approaches to sumptuous burials. Drawing upon notions of aesthetics and miniaturization, I wish to explore the always incomplete cosmologies of meaning that were expressed during the production and performance of Pontic or Iron Age funerary rites. The backdrop for this exploration is the middle period of the Pontic Iron Age, approximately 600 to 300 BC. Uh, instead of treating death solely as a biological end of a person uh, and associated mortuary practices as moments of sociological concretization, Death and burial are used here as events and opportunities of social and political manipulation to reinforce individual and group senses of sociological and cosmological, cosmological order. Sorry. I suggest that Pontic Iron Age funerary events were produced so as to create minor, miniaturized depictions of the beautiful dead that on one hand express the sublime ongoing naturalization of both sociological power and its cosmological significance, while on the other encouraged a shared sense of belonging that created docile bodies of the living and the dead alike, a technological enchantment rather than enchantment. For the Pontic Iron Age, if not more broadly, I suggest that uh, we need to grip or uh, come to terms with this idea of art uh, which needs to be, uh, probably at least for this paper, needs to be reshackled to notions of prestige and wealth. Almost going against what I was uh, saying in the introduction, but trying to take that a bit farther. But this I did not mean to get caught up in the morass of wealth, quote unquote, as roughly approximate to our modern day notion of accumulating <coughs> currency. Rather, by wealth I mean material culture that seeks to enrich and inspire. Materiality caught up in a web of extended signification that links, if not entangles, the cosmological with the sociological, the wild with the domesticated, and the living with the dead. With that in mind, I draw upon Leo Tolstoy's definitions or definitions of art as every work of art causes the receiver to enter into a certain kind of relationship, both with him or her who produced or is producing the art, and with all of those simultaneously, previously, or subsequently received the same impression. Uh, art is a means of union among men and women, joining them together in the same feelings and indispensable for the life and progress or well-being of individuals and humanity. Uh, thus, art is intentional and obviously meaningful. Art is intended to be experienced, and for what we are discussing today, should be experienced through a broader shared exploration of sensory experiences. Uh, Brian Haynes' 
astutely asked and really criticized about regarding Iron Age mortuary practices on the Eurasian steppe, that if these Iron Age models of social stratification based solely on mortuary practices and size of mounds and types of goods in mounds uh, actually fit the archaeological evidence, uh, and if there's uh, more room to play, so to speak. Uh, following Hanks, I ask if it might be better asked, to what extent or scale do characterizations of status hold up, and ultimately, what do uh, categorizations of status get us in terms of better understandings of Iron Age society, besides saying elite, semi-elite, and commoner, or something uh, like that. You can see here, uh, I'm borrowing right here, uh, from Bettina Arnold's 1991 dissertation, kind of showing the evolution of thinking about social organization and governance uh, in the West Central European Iron Age, and then the newest edition being Manuel's uh, uh, Roman Civitas. Thank you. Furthermore, what are the aesthetic uh, potentialities, if not potencies, of the materials being deposited? And were these items designed only to be items uh, used for burial, or are they implicated in other uh, Iron Age political dimensions, such as uh, those of the levy in, in the settlement? To better address these questions, I employ critical theorist uh, Susan Stewart's notion of miniaturization. Miniaturization is the production and presentation of a total object, but ultimately this object is an assembly of smaller moments and things that lend themselves to depiction demonstrating a capacity to prom promote a shared sense of belonging with something bigger or greater. Uh, Melanie Giles' uh, recent work has potent implications, I think, for this approach, as she notes that, at least with the, the uh, British Iron Age, funerary rites would have evoked uh, intense emotions, including sorrow, grief, and anger, among others. At the same time, it is also clear that death and associated funerary rites leave the living in a particularly vulnerable state of mind, a state of mind that is more susceptible to possible suggestion and manipula manipulation by the producers of the funerary performance, and hence the miniaturization of someone's life to an assembled collection of moments bound by and ultimately shared with their gender age group. In the following minutes, I uh, kind of explore this idea of the act of miniaturization, uh, as politically steeped intentional social actions leading to the production of shared experiences of and with the dead, and the production of an architected or carefully built memory of the deceased. Not only of the individual, but how that individual links with uh, gender, age, and social groups, other social groups. <laughs> Despite my ongoing and vehement uh, objection to the kind of myopic treatments of funerary practices, or really any other types of social action, exhibited in a specific context, i.e. Uh, only focusing on these giant burial mounds, which uh, I think many of us, me included, have a tendency to do because it's more visible than uh, more clearly uh, delineated than other aspects. Uh, I explore the aesthetics of one mound in particular, uh, Tosa Mohila from South Central Ukraine, which is right in there, along with its burials and grave goods. Uh, and I attempt to reconcile these findings with results from an analysis of uh, a larger sample of mounds drawn from Renato Rola's comprehensive uh, catalog of excavated Pontic Iron Age Scythian Pergons and their constituent burials published in 1979. The Tosa Mohila, or Fat Barrow, was excavated in 1971 by Boris uh, Mozalewski. The mound measured 8.6 meters high and 60 meters in diameter. For the Pergons of the Pontic Iron Age, this is actually a middle size, if not kind of smaller mound, so it's not one of the giant mounds of that period. The individual in the central tomb, presumably male, though sex has not been confirmed, had his, uh, maybe her, skeleton destroyed, uh, broken into little fragments, uh, elbow fragments of belts, uh, iron armor, splint mail, uh, bronze leg armor are found.
the sword, uh, the pectoral, uh, more than 600 golden discs that most likely would have been attached to fabric of some kind, two bronze vessels, a three-handled amphora, and a gold-decorated whip were located in a different part of the tomb and thus had not been touched. Uh, Mosolevsky suggests that the thieves did not touch this cache uh, located a short distance from the skeleton, so they were uh, in situ when he excavated. Uh, to me, this indicates that the, the individual individual's body was a subject not of thievery, but rather of ritualized dis, uh, destruction. Given that most of the grave goods were found intact, and especially that a lot of them were gold and silver, uh, including those goods uh, and bodies from other chambers in the mine, ritualized destruction of the founding father for uh, this burial population seems to highlight at least two things. First, re-entering the tomb was not necessarily about stealing wealth, but rather about signaling difference, uh, if not deliberate forgetting between the primary interment and possibly a new lineage, or the shifting of importance to another deceased individual, perhaps the male or female located uh, in the side chamber. Uh, second, the intentional not stealing indicates, at least to me, the potency of the aesthetic of these items and their participation in this ongoing work of socio-cosmologies, socio perhaps even to the extent that the overall identity of the deceased ceased to matter as personal identity was assumed by broader concerns of the community and possibly beyond. In addition to the central tomb burial, two side tombs were also constructed and put to use containing human and animal burials. Grooms were also buried in these tombs, but were not accompanied by grave goods. Uh, a third quote unquote groom was buried with a glass bead necklace, an iron bracelet, a quiver full of arrows, and two knives, uh, which suggests that they may not he may not have been a groom, but rather may have been a, a warrior accompanying uh, his kind of uh, Master, master's family in death. Perhaps of more interest for us is that each horse grave in the side tombs contained three horses with gold and silver bridle sets. Uh, one of the horses had a complete breast collar and all of the horses had belly band buckles with them. Six or possibly seven horses in total were buried with the human burials. This is interesting as uh, Mozilevsky suggests that the horses were most likely considered to be uh, prestige goods, much like Attic imports. Uh, the gold pectoral or whatever else we might categorize as prestigious as well. However, I'll be coming back to this in a minute or two as the horses, uh, as well as other animals portrayed on the grave goods, seem to have been caught up in this kind of socio cosmological significance beyond just their value as goods. Rather, it seems plausible that they were equal agents and participants in funerary display and the production of docile bodies beyond just expressions of wealth, but rather they were caught up in this uh, aesthetic work of uh, city governments. While the Tosa central chamber focuses on what is thought to be a male individual, the secondary chamber and its associated, uh, sorry, and its tombs located approximately 15 meters to the southwest of the central. Uh, of the center of the mound were left intact post burial and highlighted the burial of an alleged female and child. I will not discuss today the idea floating around that the female and, male, uh, female and child were killed to follow the male in death, especially as none of the burials in Tosa have been uh, dated and we simply do not know the order of death. More importantly, this is not the subject of today's talk. Uh, the gender obviously remains a primary consideration, I think, in general. And that was actually one of the points that Moslevsky made in 1979, both in papers that he gave and in publication, that uh, Ukrainian archaeologists and kind of a wider world of Eurasian steppe archaeology should be paying more attention to gender. Other finds for the female and child included uh, golden necklaces, finger rings, bracelets, earrings, and pendants. Uh, pottery, as well as silver and glass vessels, were located near their heads, and numerous glass beads and toiletry articles were found behind the female's head. Near the uh, female and child, four household servants, including the grooms, were buried. Uh, clearly, females and children were equally important components uh, in the ordering and governance of uh, Pontifarian society. Now, briefly, 
Uh, a few years ago, I translated uh, Renata Rolla's catalog of uh, basically all of the excavated cargons of the Pontic Steppe, or at least, uh, so I think it's 111 or 110 cargons which have been excavated. Uh, and out of that, I randomly sampled 85 burials that uh, my analysis could handle. So I did a multi-dimensional scaling just to see how these burials uh, and their grave assemblages matched up without considering gender uh, or age. So what we ended up with was a pretty clear line showing a cluster to your right and a less uh, strongly clustered group to your left. Uh, after going through each of those burials and looking and picking apart the relationships between grave goods, uh, the only conclusion was saying, thank you, uh, was that this is actually uh, all females. So not all of the skeletons have been uh, anthropologically sexed as of yet. But uh, certainly, Certainly, uh, there's a lot of commonalities, and uh, I'm working on publishing this right now, so I can talk more about this later, trying to get us caught up in time. Uh, the male graves, however, showed much more uh, kind of agency as far as what was buried with them. So their identities as constructed or produced were less cohesive, whereas female identity was much more cohesive. And my uh, interpretation of that was that power came to rest, and this may be somewhat controversial, I know I've argued with Brian Angus and actually Bettina Arnold with us about this as well, uh, is that power actually came to rest with uh, the matrilineal line. That women as, let's say, hostesses, which we've heard about before, uh, really the seat of power was with them. Males were often bouncing around, going, uh, acting as mercenaries, bringing goods back. Uh, and I think as kind of in place ideas of power, women were it. So, uh, seemingly all participants in Iron Age burials were a part of, of this aesthetic, uh, this carefully constructed aesthetic when it comes to women. Uh, there was more play with uh, men's burials or male burials. Uh, and that's something you know, I can talk about later. Uh, that in turn played into the broader socio-cosmological order that governed uh, Pontic Iron Age life. Pontic funerary rites were as much about reinforcing the order through the production and display of the beautiful and satisfying the broader populace through dazzling displays and effects as it was about honoring and celebrating the dead. The amount of bling in these burials certainly obscured some senses of personal identity while promoting others. In other words, males, females, and children were miniaturized in different ways in death. Rather, deceased individuals became miniaturized media through which the naturalization and reinforcement of Pontic socio-cosmologies of meaning were expressed. Now. <laughs>